you know, and I'll just take over and then turn it back to you. All so right. Thanks again for being here, Bubba. Really good to see you. You too, brother. Yeah. All right, Bubba, looks like we're ready to go. Are you ready? I'm ready. Good morning. Okay, very good. Good morning, everybody. It is Friday, March 18th, 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. That means our guest, Bubba Garner, is in the Houston area, one hour behind, I believe, right? 8 a.m.? So That's correct. 8 a.m. in the office. Not too early. Very good. Anyway, we've been doing this series on the last few Fridays we call One Lesson, and I'd like to clarify what that is and what we mean by that. Um, we're looking at ways to help fellow preachers, fellow Christians in presenting the gospel. As doing some research and talking with a lot of brethren, I've noticed and realized that a lot of us are just apprehensive. We're scared to death on how would we introduce the Bible to someone who is a prospect. We don't know where to start. We don't know where to go. And we've had a lot of good lessons so far, and I'm confident our guest today will bring us another good lesson on something that he studied and something that he does to, you know, whet the appetite of someone who is interested in Bible matters. And, uh, and let me just clarify, there's not just one lesson. I call it one lesson because I want my speakers to give me one lesson they would give to a, pro a prospect. But let's remind ourselves that Jesus had more than one lesson. Paul had more than one lesson as they went about the the countryside and preach to the crowds. So you really have to know your audience. And that's the challenge of these speakers. Who is their audience? Well, you're the audience and I'll be Bubba's direct audience. And he can pretend if I'm a new convert, know nothing, know something. Well, I'm curious to see where he goes with this. And anyway, it'll be encouraging and enlightening to us and appreciate Bubba taking time uh, to be with us this uh, next few minutes. What I'll do is lead us in a word of prayer, then Bubba, I'll let you take over. So let's pray together. Father in heaven, it's again good that we can be here together. We thank you so much for, well, the means that we have, the internet, that can be used for bad, but also can be used for good. And as we talk to each other and try to help each other and strengthen each other, that the audience can be edified about how to approach things and how to be a better student and how to be a better teacher and presenter of the gospel. We pray for wisdom in all these things. We're thankful for the blessings you give us. Be with us now. It's in your son's name. Amen. Okay, Bubba, I was going to let you take over there, and I'll see where you what path you take us down. All right. Well, I'll be anxious to see what path you go to. Uh, I want to say, first of all, that uh, what I use in the one lesson uh, has been developed through the years as you... Uh, teach people, and as you watch other people teach people, uh, you add things and you see things that are effective, and you try to uh, include those in the things that you do. The reason I think that one lesson approach uh, is so effective is if we're going to teach the urgency of obeying the gospel and that the day of the Lord is coming and we don't know the day nor the hour. I think we need to communicate that in how we teach. I'm not saying that there are not situations where it may take several lessons. If somebody is starting from scratch or knows nothing uh, where we have to gauge where they are and talk about things like authority and how the Bible came about. I don't mean that. But if, if there is truly an urgency of salvation, then, then we should try as often as we can uh, to, to make sure people know what they need to, to do to be saved and to, and to do that the same hour of the night as we see in examples in Acts. So I, I love the study. As soon as you sent the email and I saw the title, I knew it was something that I would, I'd love to be a part of because that's the way I, I feel about it. And so uh, if, if you and I were, were seated in my office or if we were at your kitchen table or in your living room at your house, I would start 
the very same way I saw Ricky Shanks start a Bible study several years ago in which he would pick out an object in the room and ask, how long do you think this table is or how tall do you think this door is over there? And he would have everyone give their, whoever's in the study, give their guess. And, you know, some people will say, oh, it's two feet. Some might say it's 18 inches, whatever. And then he would ask, uh, well, what is the surefire way we can know how, how long this object is? And, of course, everybody answers, you would, you'd measure it. And wouldn't you know, Ricky Shanks had a tape measure in his pocket. Now, I, I've not taken a tape measure, but, but I've made certain they understood the principle that we have a standard of measurement. 12 inches is one foot. And the only way we can know for sure how long this is, is we're going to measure it. Because what that does is eliminate our, our guesses. You know, somebody could say, well, my grandmother told me that that was this long, or I've always believed it was this long. We, we have to agree <clears throat> that what the ruler says is what will be the final answer. And so then the, the next step is obvious. Do you agree with me that we're going to use the Bible as our standard of measurement, our ruler? And no matter what we read today, if it's different than what your grandparents told you or what your preacher says or, or what you've always believed, are, are you going to be true to the ruler? Because if we can't agree on that, then, then really there's, there's no point in us continuing our study. And would you believe, I, I've never had anyone tell me at the start, no, I, I don't wanna go any further. I, I think there's, a, there's always been a, a, a respect for the Bible that I wanna do what it says and, and what it finds, I'm gonna use that uh, to apply to whatever my situation is in life. So that's, uh, that's an important uh, uh, illustration at the beginning because I keep coming back to that as we go through the study. Remember the ruler, apply the measurement to, uh, to our circumstances. So uh, I've also found Jeff uh, it useful on occasion to have two identical Bibles in the study. You may you may be studying with someone who, who doesn't know their way around the scriptures as far as where the books are, mm -hmm. and it can eliminate a lot of awkwardness or embarrassment of, of somebody trying to find a book where I'll just say, okay, it's on this page because it's the exact same Bible that I'm using. Uh, or if, if they do know the, the scriptures, uh, I'll call out the verse and then let them read it. It, it does two things. One, it, it keeps them included in, in what we're doing. And second, if they are using their Bible, then, uh, th th then they know it's not just I've, I've found some version that says, says it the way I want it to say it. No, this is the Bible I use, and these are the, the very words of, of the ruler that, that God has, has given for salvation. So uh, just, just something there to, to help keep the study going. Mm -hmm. So the first place I like to start is in Acts chapter 16 and verse 30, where, uh, where we see a Bible question, and that's the question uh, for which we've come together in our, our one lesson study. That's why uh, we, we got together to, uh, to look at this question. That's, of course, where uh, the jailer says to Paul and Silas in Philippi, what must I do to be saved? And that's, that's what I call the, the study. What must I do to be saved? And since that is a Bible question, it deserves a Bible answer. And so uh, we, we look at that question, and then that question is going to guide our, our study. So the, the first thing we notice is that uh, what must I do to be saved, that implies a, a lost condition. 
you wouldn't ask that question unless you realized uh, the the current status I'm in needs repair, needs uh, salvation, and so we we start with uh, what what was God's ideal for man? What was the perfect scenario uh, that God created man? Of course, that's back in the garden. Mm -hmm. So we look at uh, uh, the creation of man in Genesis 2, and, uh, and we see the, the, the perfect uh, picture of a relationship where man was created last, and then the seventh day, the Sabbath given for man and God to enjoy a, a fellowship together. And so what I'll do is, is I'll write on a, a piece of paper, God and man, and, and have them together. That's what God wanted, God and man to dwell together. Uh, but then Genesis 3 happens, and sin enters the world. And so we'll read Genesis 2 and uh, find what God had said about uh, the garden and man's responsibilities in the garden. And then we'll read Satan in chapter 3, verses 1 through 7, and how he tempted Eve and, and ultimately Adam to sin. And so in that perfect picture of God and man, uh, now I write sin in between, that it's come to separate. God was not making an idle threat when he said, in the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Uh, they, were, they were banished from the garden and the tree of life. But it also, of course, began a, a spiritual death, a death in the relationship where God and man are now separated. And so from there, we go to Isaiah 59, verses 1 and 2, and uh, have them read that out loud so they can hear it, that uh, it wasn't that God's hand was sh short or his ear deaf, that he could not save you, but your sins have made a separation between you and your God. So, so here's why we're asking the question, what must I do to be saved? It's because of sin. And, and just to be, be clear, I go from there to uh, Romans chapter 5 uh, to show that it's not Adam's sin that separates us from God, but Paul said, death spread to all men because all have sinned. And that's uh, Romans 5 and verse 12. Uh, let me, uh, let me stop there and, and say that uh, I also, uh, at the end of the study, I give them a, a copy of everything we've gone together, gone over together with all the verses. That way uh, they can, can go back and look at those or they can, uh, that they don't feel pressured uh, that uh, I'm, I'm shoving all this information and trying to get a uh, uh, a response like some kind of a salesman, uh, but it's 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 something that they if if at the end they're still still don't feel ready they can continue to to study mm -hmm. on their own, and and that started uh, because of a uh, 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 one of our members who had in, asked me to come study with a friend of hers, and uh, I had I had done that. And, and went over the things I usually do. And afterwards, she asked me, she said, well, can I have a copy of what you did? And so, uh, so I did that for her. And then I thought, well, you know, that's, that's something that would be good to give to the, the person too. So just another way of, of, of one instance that, uh, that helped further on uh, where, where we help one another do this right. I think so. If I may interrupt you for just a moment, I'll let you continue. But I think that's a brilliant idea. One thing I think all of us can do listening and trying to better ourselves is to ask our P3 
people we've studied with. Where did I go right? Where did I go wrong? What was helpful? What was not helpful? And honestly, listen for that answer. And I think that's brilliant. And so what I'm going to ask you to do is when we're done, email me your outline there because I'd like to see it and add it to my, because what I plan to do at the end of this, I'm going to put together sort of a, all resources that I've learned from this. There's been a lot of good ones, but I'd like to see your outline if you don't mind. But again, do a, as what I learned in the business world before I got into preaching, a post-mortem on what the project just ended on and what, what lessons can we learn? And I think it's valuable to listen to those you've studied with and see what worked and didn't work. So very good. Okay. Let's Absolutely. In fact, I was thinking as I was uh, uh, studying this for today, each each time uh, I, I came to a different part, I had a different memory of, right. <laughs> of, of being with somebody. And, you know, there's always uh, uh, distractions when you're in somebody else's home. Uh, you know, the, there's a baby crying or, or they're, they've got a kid with them that keeps coming in and out or a dog uh, yapping. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, it's just, uh, they're, they're precious memories like that, that, uh, you, you wonder how did I even get through this with all mm -hmm. that going on in the background? But uh, I tell you, Bubba, I, for, for, for fun, you know, what I do often is uh, I've been in studies where the TV is left on, they just have a habit of, and it drives me crazy. And so what I do is I grab a chair and I sit in front of the TV and I figured all the furniture is facing towards the TV anyway. Let me just take up that time. And for my own personal reasons, I because I've, I've seen the TV on louder than anything and nobody's watching it. But it's like, this is not my house. But man, can we <laughs> shut that thing off, please? But anyway, yes. you're right. A lot of good memories come out of these. This is the battle. Easy stuff, obviously. But yep, it does bring yeah. back some good memories. That's, yeah. a, that's a great idea. <laughs> my problem is uh the tv's always uh mounted on the wall higher than me <laughs> of course most things are higher than me okay yes sir yep. <laughs> all right so so finishing up that very first section on if, if i'm asking what must i do to be saved that that's a recognition of a lost condition so while we're there at romans 5 12 uh, we just go over to Romans 6 and verse 23, uh, the wages of sin is death. So that's where we are on our, our little diagram. We've got sin in between God and man. And then the, the second half of that same verse is, is going to guide us through the rest of this study. The wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So what must I do to be saved? That's, that implies a urgent requirement. Here's, here's where I am. All right. So now what must I do? Sin is, is personal. It's a, a conscious choice that each person makes to reject the will of God. We, uh, uh, we know what God wants and, and he has put within us a moral sense of right and wrong, uh, but we rebel. Uh, we read in the scriptures what his will is and we, we go our own way. And so if, if I'm gonna ask what must I do, that's, that's uh, a requirement that's urgent to, to take this sin away. Uh, it's important for people to notice here uh, what God has done to, to make this a, a possibility, uh, what work he did so that our sins could be forgiven. And so here's where we, we talk about Jesus and his relationship to our sin. And so we look at passages, for instance, like the announcement of his birth in Matthew 1, 21, that he came to save his people from their sins. That was his, his purpose for coming to the earth. Um, John 1, 29, he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Uh, so, so Jesus is the access by which our sins can be forgiven. That which separates us from God 
can be removed. And, and we make certain to point out that it, it wasn't uh, Jesus' sin that he paid the, the penalty of death for. He had no sin. And so, again, we look at passages like uh, 1 Peter 2, where uh, he, when was being reviled, he didn't revile in return. He, he uttered no threats. He didn't retaliate, uh, kept entrusting himself to God. Uh, Hebrews 4, where uh, he's been tempted in all points as we are, verses uh, 15 and following, yet without sin. So, so Jesus was the perfect sacrifice. He did not die for his sin, uh, but he died for our sin uh, to pay the penalty what we deserve. And uh, why would God do that for us? Why would God send his son to, to die in our place? And that just shows how much he he loves us. He so loved the world that he gave his son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So, uh, so looking at our, our diagram of God and man with sin, uh, when, you, when you see that Jesus came to take away the sin of the world, uh, then you, you cross out sin and, and, and you ask, well, it is are, are you interested in having your sins forgiven? Do you want your sins taken away so that uh, you and God can be restored? And uh, again, uh, one, one study that stands out is uh, a young man who's said to me, uh, well, is there anything we can do in the next 30 seconds that can take care of that? Uh, you know, people are, are, uh, are brought to where they are and, uh, and they want to know, well, you know, what must I do? How, how can I, uh, in response to what God has done, what can I do to, to take, have my sins forgiven? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the kind of heart that you're after. You know, you want somebody, uh, who, who is so, uh, invested in their salvation that they'll they'll do whatever uh, because we've all had we've all had the opposite uh, we've all had those who uh, for whatever reason decided they they didn't want to do it and uh, so we we just keep keep praying and and, and offering to, to study with them all right so so we've got now uh our, our lost condition, um, um, I need to be saved. We've seen the urgency of it, that it's something I, I must do. And now we're going to focus on what, what has God said for us to do to be saved? What must I do was the, the question of the, uh, the jailer. Mm -hmm. And here's where likely... Uh, applying the ruler is is going to be different from what people have heard or or done in the past, and so uh, so we're we're really going to stress that uh, we agreed to to follow the Bible, what it says. Uh, didn't doesn't matter what I think or you think. Uh, we're going to follow the ruler. And so uh, what must I do? That implies a, an active response. Uh, so, so we need to, to stress that salvation is, is God's gift. It's, uh, it's the product of his mercy and grace. We don't deserve it. Uh, we don't work our way to earn it. Uh, but at the same time, God also gives us things to do as a response to his gift. And uh, here's another instance where uh, I heard a, a, an illustration that has, has been helpful in this regard. If, uh, if somebody says, I'm going to give you, and, and you can tell this is dated because people don't read magazines anymore, but the illustration was, I'm going to give you a subscription to uh, your favorite magazine. And I did that because I, I love you and I want you to have it. 
and it's my gift to you. And so every month it's going to come to your, your mailbox. Uh, the only way for you to enjoy the gift and to benefit and appreciate the gift is, is you'll have to go out of your house down to your mailbox and, and receive it. Uh, now it's still a gift. It's, it's still something I gave you uh, because I wanted you to have it. Uh, but there's also a, an active role on your part to, to receive it. You've no more earned it uh, than, uh, than somebody who says by, by responding to God's gift, we earn our salvation. Uh, but we see that it, there's a, a, an, an active part on, on both parties with reference to the gift. Mm -hmm. So what must I do? And here's where we'll, we'll look at several instances in the book of Acts to just to show what, what did people do in the first century. Yes, before you go there real quick, um, I love you, Bubba. I think that illustration needs to be updated. <laughs> I love the magazine. I think it, you said it's dated. That's a, that's a good one, though. It illustrates the gift. And I'm curious to see who's listening and maybe Facebook comments if somebody else might have a, a maybe a more update, modern illustration of that. But your illustration is perfect of how that works. And I've heard this phrase recently, and it helps me explain this, the dual nature of salvation. God's done his part. We have to do our part. And you can think of Noah being saved. He had to build the ark. And Naaman was saved. He had to do the dipping in the seven times. It's no different for us. And what I'm running around with now is a bunch of people that are wedded to this idea of saved by faith, not with works and anything as a work. And to explain that, I go to that dual nature of salvation. You have to do your part to receive that gift. But again, I like your illustration. I, I, you don't mind me just kind of picking on you a little bit about oh, that. Oh, yeah. Um, that's a good, great illustration, but you know, there has to be a, that's fine. Telling college kids today, magazine subscription, they're going to say, what in the world are you? And I might even say email. They might even say, what are you talking about? That's just where we are today. But right. anyway, very good. I'm sorry. Thank you for that. So very good. Okay. What does it take to be saved is where you were going next. Yes. And, uh, and, and that is a, a, a battle that we, we face because uh, if, if we do anything uh, in the minds of, of many religious people, uh, then we're, we're earning our salvation, you know, and, and, uh, and they'll, they'll be quick to point out that it's, uh, we're saved by grace through faith and not of works. Ephesians and, 2 8 is memorized exactly right right which uh, of course the works there are are the works we do after we're saved the the good works that God has has called us to do uh, I, I think I it's just, a proper yeah, I'm sorry I think it's a proper definition of works and then looking at what baptism does that's what I try to go with that here's and you maybe get there later when you get to your next section here but Let's properly define what baptism does for you. Now, how can you deny this as Romans 6 is a favorite about what baptism does? If they just look at it as a work, I think they're using Bible as a straw man argument, and it's not right. accurate. You need to appropriately define that. But uh, you're right. There's a lot of resistance there. And so anyway, curious to see where you go next. I'm sorry. But, but even, even the passage they use uh, by, by grace through faith, well, faith is a response. Faith is something we do. It, it, it may be here uh, in their minds, but, but faith is still something we respond uh, with to the grace of God. So uh, my point is that faith is, is the starting place and the things that follow flow out of faith. And so what must I do? Uh, number one, I must believe. And, and the reason uh, this has, well, let me just say it this way. Uh, another study that, uh, that brought back uh, a powerful memory in my mind was uh, when we did get to, to baptism and uh, a gentleman was in hearty agreement with, with everything I was saying. And it... Uh, it, it finally came out that the baptism he was talking about was 
uh, when his parents had him baptized as a, uh, a baby, uh, christened. And so that told me not to take for granted this, this first uh, response of faith or belief. You know, I, I just assumed uh, most people already understood that. But if but to respond in faith or belief, how how can that be if someone else is deciding for me that I'm going to be baptized or, or christened? So everything that we do must flow out of our conviction that Jesus Christ is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so uh, so I spend uh, a, a lot of time, a lot of verses looking at, at belief, that we don't do it because it's a family religion. We don't do it uh, because uh, we, we want to get married to someone who believes this. Uh, we do it because with all our heart, we're convicted that this is true. And so uh, we'd already cited uh, John 3.16, uh, but but looking at our passage in, in Acts 16, 30, uh, what's the next thing that they say to this man who says, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus. So uh, if, if I'm going to uh, ask this question, what must I do? Uh, I need to understand first that I must believe this. This has to be my own faith not something that my parents want me to do, uh, not something that uh, we've always done, but it's something that I truly believe and, and I'm ready to, uh, to stand on my own convictions. Uh, so we start with faith. I must believe, must believe. But are we saved by faith alone? Is faith the only requirement? Is that all that we must do. James says, even the demons believe, James 2 and verse 19. So secondly, we must repent. And for here, of course, we'll go to Acts 2 and verse 38, where uh, the people on Pentecost asked a very similar question, brethren, what shall we do? They've been brought under the conviction of their sins of crucifying the Lord Jesus. And so they want to know, what must I do? Their sins have separated them from God and man. So what must I do? And Peter says, repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And so we'll talk about what repentance is. It's not just uh, feeling sorry for what you've done or having guilt or shame, those things are all important, uh, but those are to move you or lead you to repentance, a, a godly sorrow that seeks change uh, to reverse, uh, and in this instance, to, to return to God. I'm, I'm ready to change, and and we need to understand that uh, when, when we're studying with, with some people, uh, that that's going to, there, there'll be instances where drastic changes are in order. You know, that may not always be the case, say, if we're studying with teenagers of the, of the local church where we preach or, or maybe a, a spouse or someone who's been coming with one of the members. Uh, these, the, there are some people that, uh, that we study with that, uh, that are of the world and have, have led lives that are, are very messy. And so we need to have compassion uh, and understanding when we get to this point uh, that that change is in some instances going to be very drastic. Good stuff, Bubba. Let me ask this question about godly sorrow under repentance. 
see if you think I'm on the right track here. I want to see what your take is. When I talk about godly sorrow as part of that repentance and 2 Corinthians 7 verses 9 and following, I compare that as a contrast to worldly sorrow. And I think this goes to the motive. What's the difference here? A difference, you know, could be you're sorry you got caught. That's an obvious one. But I give this example. A wife may say to her drunk husband, if you don't stop drinking, I'm going to leave you. And if he stops drinking, that's good. It's healthy for the marriage. He's better off that way. But what was the motive there? I would argue it's probably a worldly motive. And that's not wrong of her to say, you need to stop drinking, whatever it takes. But really, you need to be motivated by a godly sorrow. This is an affront to God as to why you're doing these uh, you're convicted of these changes. And this, to me, that takes it to a whole new level. This is the motive for being a Christian. It is a godly sorrow. You realize who God is. You realize what your sin has done. And I think it's important that we understand that. My motivation for changing is to, as you put it, uh, change and have a return to God, not to return my marriage to a, to a better place, which is important. But we're talking about being right with God here. It has to be predicated and motivated by this godly sorrow that is, I've done wrong with God. And you're right, we need to be patient with those folks. What do you think about that approach for, you know, godly versus worldly sorrow? I, I like that. In fact, uh, it, it puts God in, in the center of it. We've, uh, we've sinned against God. We've, we've hurt God. And, mm -hmm. and so he's the one we're wanting to appease, uh, and so uh, godly sorrow uh, puts, puts God in our mind. We want to we please him and, and return to him. I, I really like that. Well, sorrow can be sorrow. You can have the tears, you can have the grief, you can have the anguish. But what's motivating that? That's where I think it needs to be. And that's why I think the Holy Spirit adds godly sorrow there specifically for us to draw our minds to that. Yes, okay. that's outstanding. Very good. Thank you, Bubba. All right. So uh, I use uh, an, another illustration here while we're in Acts 2, uh, where the people ask, uh, what must I do? Uh, what shall we do? So back when uh, Melissa and I were expecting our, our first child, Morgan, who's now 20, uh, we had done a lot of research and, and found this, it's called a generation crib, where it starts out as a, as a baby crib, but then you can uh, transform it as the child grows into a, a day bed, a youth bed, and then finally like a, a twin bed with a headboard and a footboard. And so we thought that'd be a good investment and uh, Morgan, her bed can kind of grow up with her. Well, we had to, to order it special at a place across town in Houston, and uh, it finally came in. I mean, it was several weeks till it came in, and uh, didn't have a pickup truck. I, I know Bubba, you know, think you he probably drives a truck. Had to borrow a truck and drive across Houston to pick up this bed, and and got there. And the sales lady at the front desk told me. I'm sorry, we, we just sold that to somebody else. So the, the manager comes out and uh, he says to me this exact, exact question, what do I need to do to make this right? Uh, see, see, I was in that case, the offended party. And so he was allowing me to set the terms to, uh, to make it right. These people were asking, what must I do? Or what shall we do? God was the offended party. And so he got to set the terms for what they needed to do. It was not, uh, I'll, I'll make a sacrifice or uh, I'll, I'll do what I think would, uh, would please God. When, when Peter said, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, he was just saying what Jesus, who had all authority in heaven on earth, said, go into all the world, make disciples, teaching and baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So Peter was just 
saying these are the words of the king. This is what the king has said. You want to be a part of his kingdom, then you come and, and submit to him. You bow to him. So, so we're taking the ruler out again, and we're saying, okay, are these things that, that I have done? I must believe. I must repent. It's, it's something that's going to require a, a life change to, to have my sins forgiven. I, I, I want those taken away so that God and me and God are, are back together. But am I willing to do what God had said, has said for the, the terms of pardon? And then uh, that leads to we must confess. And so we'll go, for instance, to uh, Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 with the eunuch where uh, he says, here is water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. So to uh, confess uh, just simply means to speak the same thing. So we are speaking what God has said about his son. God said, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And so when I confess that, I'm saying I agree with what God said. This is the son of the living God. And we'll go to Romans chapter 10, verses 9 and 10, about if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Uh, that same verse uh, will we'll just make a, a very quick point uh, that the thief on the cross could not have done either one of those. He was not at a point where he could believe that God raised Jesus from the dead. He could not confess Jesus as Lord and Christ because he had not been uh, a victor of sin and death and placed at the right hand of God on high. Uh, so uh, before we get to baptism and that argument comes out as, hey, what about the thief on the cross? Uh, mm -hmm. we, can, we can take the legs out right here to say, see, he couldn't have done that. Uh, but, but I must, I can, therefore... I must. And uh, a, a good illustration here is uh, if you've ever sat in a exit row of the airplane and, you know, they always come by and, and show you the little pamphlet and say, if you're going to sit in this seat, you have a responsibility. If uh, there's some kind of event where you'll have to, uh, the flight attendants are going to be elsewhere, you'll have to open this door and, and help people off. And so they go one by one and you have to verbally say, yes, you know, you can't have your little earbuds in and, and kind of nod or you're reading and say, oh, sure. No, they, they say, I need you to, to say it out loud. And that's what we do when we confess. We, we verbally assent. This is what I believe. And I'm not ashamed to confess. I believe that Jesus is the son of the living God. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, what must I do? What is my active response to what God has done? I, I must be baptized. Baptism is the point at which the scriptures show that our sins are washed away and forgiven. And so we'll uh, we'll go to Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, and Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And uh, here's where the, the ruler now is actually Jesus himself, who has all authority. And uh, his commission to the disciples was to go and make more disciples, be fruitful and multiply but you do that uh, by baptizing them. He who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Uh, a great one is Acts 22 and verse 16, where uh, all those things had happened to Saul for three days and three nights. He'd been fasting and, and likely praying 
uh, he had spoken to Jesus. He, he knew who, who uh, Jesus was uh, and what, what Saul had done to his people. And uh, still, Ananias says, why do you delay? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. So, so the baptism was the point at which Saul's sins would be washed away. It wasn't baptism only. It, it wasn't just the, the act of him uh, getting wet. Uh, but as 1 Peter 3 and verse 21 tells us, uh, it's a, uh, a, a response for a, a clear conscience. It's an appeal to God to, to do what he has promised. Uh, when we do what he has commanded to have our sins washed away. Baptism is not a, a symbol or a, a ritual. It's something that I, I must do if, if I want the forgiveness of sins. And, and here again, are, are we applying the ruler? This may be different than what you've been taught or what you've heard or what you've always believed. But is, is this what the ruler requires when we apply it to our situation? What must I do? I must be baptized. Just like I must believe, I must repent, and, uh, and I must confess. So, uh, excellent. Now we come full circle to our, where we began with God and man. So now sin has been washed away. It's been removed. It's been forgiven. And God has what he's always wanted. And, and we have what we wanted in the beginning when we asked, what must I do to be saved? Now we're back into a, a fellowship with God. Uh, now, now here, how are we doing on time? Okay. So so once we, uh, we, we go through that, uh, I, I believe strongly in, in bringing them to a point of decision. Now, it, it, is, it is my uh, practice uh, to ask these questions one time, and, and I tell them that. I'm, I'm not trying to get you to do this for me, and I'm not trying to pressure you into doing something you're not ready to do. And, and I, I certainly uh, don't want you to look back on this moment and think I didn't know what I was doing and, and did it anyway and create some kind of doubt in your mind. Mm -hmm. but, but I say I'll, I want to close by asking three questions and, uh, and to uh, again, to show the benefit of just uh, experience, uh, the first question uh, that I asked them, I learned from our, uh, our fellow mentor, John Kilgore. I had uh, a kid in my cabin one year uh, that was uh, wanting to be baptized. And uh, so I, I had to get the, the key from, to the pool um, and had to go to John's cabin and wake him up in the middle of the night. And uh, he asked the, the young boy, he said, I, I want to know something. He said, are you a sinner? And so that's, that's my first question I ask. Are you a sinner? And sometimes you'll get the response of, well, no. You know, I'm not a sinner uh, because they're they're thinking in in terms of you know I've I've not uh, been on trial or I've not committed some crime or or uh, they go to the worst possible scenario. Uh, but remember, sin's what separates us from God. Sin is what has caused Him to hide His face from us because He detests it. And so until we understand that I need salvation, that I'm asking what must I do to be saved because I'm lost, uh, until we can say, yes, I'm a sinner, 
uh, then, then the other questions are irrelevant. So are you a sinner? And, uh, and I, I don't, I don't mean people take pride in, in saying yes, but, but the, the overwhelming response, uh, very often with, uh, with tears is yes, that's, that's why I'm here. The acknowledgement, right? Exactly. Yes. Right. So question number two, do you believe that Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Do you believe that's, that's why he came and that's the plan of God from the beginning? Do you believe that, that through Jesus, your sins can be forgiven? And, uh, and hopefully by what we've studied together and, and what they've brought to the study, they will say, yes, I believe that, that he is the way for my sins to be forgiven, the lamb that was sacrificed for sin. And that leads to question number three. Would you like for me to baptize you right now and have Jesus wash your sins away? And uh, to this question, I've, I've received yes and no. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sometimes it's, uh, uh, you know, let's, let, let's do it right now, wherever we are, you know, if they have a swimming pool or uh, a lot of times we'll, we'll go to the church building just for convenience. Um, that also allows a little time if they want to call family members or loved ones who, who they'd like to be there. Uh, but again, it's, it's the urgency. Uh, we want to do this right now. Uh, you know, I've, I've never understood where some will say, uh, yes, let's do this next Sunday, or uh, let's do this this coming Wednesday night, uh, perhaps thinking that the only time we could do it is, is when the church is assembled. And so that's why I, I began to phrase the question, would you like me to, to baptize you right now to mm -hmm. have your sins washed away, have mm -hmm. Jesus washed your sins away? Mm -hmm. So it, it it brings that urgency and, and really if, if this is something that they're uh, grief stricken about, then, then yes. Uh, it, uh, uh, Jeff was a powerful reminder for, for me with, with my kids, you know, you, you struggle as a father with, uh, with helping your, your kids understand what to do to be saved and, uh, you know, you, you wrestle with, uh, are they too young? Are they ready? And so the, the way, the way I knew for certain, uh, cause Morgan and I had, had studied together and it was the day that she quit asking for my permission, but she told me I'm being baptized today, whether you do it or not. And so she had, she come to that that urgent moment where she knew uh, I need to do this because my soul is, is in jeopardy. And that's what we want for people. We want them to come to that point that they say, yes, I, I want you to do this right now. And then, you know, there, there's some who, uh, who will just say, no, I, I need to, to think more about this, or I need to, to read these verses again. And, uh, and of course, that's, that, that's an appropriate response in the sense that uh, you want them to see it for themselves. And, and that's why I don't ask twice. I, I, don't, I don't want to pressure them uh, to feel like they're doing it for any other reason than, than they understand they, they need to do that. And so what I do is say, okay, well, here's my phone number. Uh, any hour of the night, you decide you're ready. Uh, the, the invitation is there and, and I wanna help you any way I can. Uh, so you, you uh, allow them to see that God has done his part and then 
hopefully you've convicted them that uh, they need to do their part. Right, very good. Excellent job. I'm gonna, I have a couple of questions for you, Bubba, but before we get there real quick, Cheryl Mock on Facebook says, thank you for clearly laying the simple foundations of salvation according to God's word. Great job as usual, Bubba. So there's one of the comments of many that you're going to see on Facebook. Thank you, Cheryl. And let me say this, what I like about this, a lot of us know that, you know, four or five part plan of salvation here, believe, confess, repent, be baptized. And you went through that. But before you did, you laid the why. The why is you spent time on the fact we are sinners. And I think that's important also. And I'm glad that you have that. You, you methodically went through that about what sin is what sin does and the fact that we are sinners. And I think in a very, um, I think respectful way, you're not accusing, Hey, you're a sinner, boy, you better do something about this. It's we've all sinned and this is the human condition. And because of that, here's what God has done for us. He could have ignored us. He could have destroyed us. Uh, he didn't have to create us in the first place, but he took the initiative as uh, Romans five twelve is one of my favorites. You know, God loves us while we were sinners Imagine how he's going to treat us when we're reconciled to him. I think those are just great ideas to think about. Anyway, I'm glad you brought that out in the way you did. So I'm looking forward to your outline. I wrote a lot of it down, but I'm looking forward to your outline. But let me ask a couple things here. Um, is the Bible the standard? That's the first question you have. I think that's a fantastic place to start. That's establishing authority. Do we agree with this or don't we? What if somebody says they don't believe? I don't believe in this. Where do you go with that? Well, that would that would require uh, a study more on uh, evidences, uh, the the evidences of creation or uh, how we got the Bible. Um, I mean, it if somebody is under the uh, impression that the Bible is written by man, uh, you. you can't really get anywhere showing fulfilled prophecies or uh, or the plan of God because they'll just say, well, that was those things were done and then then written afterward. Uh, so there has to be some kind of uh, of conviction that there is a God and that He did provide uh, the Bible for us. So it would it would have to to go back to just uh, things about. Uh, evidences and creation, things like that. You know, my my lens is I spent the last eight years in the near Portland, Oregon area. So you can imagine the type of people I was getting. Now I've moved to Central Florida, much different audience. I'm going to mm -hmm. say this as kindly and respectfully as I can, but most of my neighbors are tulip loving Calvinist. And so it's a lot different audience than I had in Portland, Oregon, where there's a lot of antagonism and so forth. But here's what I would do often when I try to start off with the same question standard. No, I don't believe, but hey, they're, in, they're willing to have a conversation. You know, a lot of things is look at creation, look at Genesis 1, look at the questions that God asked Job in Job 38 through 41. Where were you? Where were you? It kind of humbles you. There's no answer for those questions. Were you at the recesses of the depth? Have you been in the stars? Were you there when I, all those questions, and at least that'll establish some humility. And maybe there is a God, maybe there is a God worth paying attention to now, which one or places like Romans one and verse 20, um, look around and tell me there's no God for these things. To me, that's where a lot of these start. And I'll tell you a funny story for me, twice this has happened. I go through an evidences thing, and I think I've got to get beefed up on what you said. You know, we're going to talk about evolution, macro versus micro. We're going to talk about Bibles from God or not. How do we know? Six months of that, and they're still asking questions. Okay, let's just scrap that, and let's read the book of Mark together. And by about the chapter eight, I'm ready to be a Christian. So I've, that's, that's not going to work with everybody, but that's just, I had to give up on the trying to prove the evidences and trying to instill faith in them. Another time I just gave up on the evidences and just read Matthew five through seven. Let's just do a detailed, Paul Earnhardt has a great book on the Sermon on the Mount, among many others. This will get you acquainted with the teachings of, of God. And let me see what you think about this. So it's, the evidences is great to initial start, but you're trying to instill faith. So how do you go about that? It, is, is the Bible the standard? That's interesting how people respond. And you're right. Don't dare go forward until they have an appreciation for this. It's a waste of time. Mm -hmm. So um, question I have, a final question for you. 
is once somebody is converted, once somebody come out, comes out of the waters of the baptism, uh, what's, what lessons, what topics do you think is important at that point? And here's what I'm after. We don't want to birth a bunch of babies and let them just kind of crawl around on their own. We want to help ground them and teach them some basics. And I have a whole list of things here. It's, I'm adding and taking away from these things. But uh, as a person who comes out of the waters of baptism, I say, we've been studying, but guess what? Now the study really begins because we want to get you grounded. My guess is you've thought about this. Do you have any topics or things that you think is important for a new Christian to get grounded in? Are you familiar with the material that uh, Max Dawson and Tony Mock wrote when they were working? Or not at all. It's not called at all. Getting, getting Started Right. I'll send that to you uh, Great. With, the, with the outline today. It, okay. it is wonderful material. We have taught that here as a 13-week class uh, for, for new converts. We didn't call it that because we didn't want people to feel conscious, uh, feel subconscious about going in there. Uh, yeah. but getting started right. And so it, it covers things about the church, uh, things like uh, worship and the work of the church. It covers uh, principles of authority and uh, Christian life, uh, evangelism. You know, a lot of times our, our new Christians are our, our greatest evangelists because number one, they're freshly convicted and, and relieved for what God has done for them. But right. then they also have uh, family members, friends uh, that they want to share it with. So uh, I think it is important to, uh, uh, to not say, well, we've got them baptized. Uh, we'll move on to somebody else, but to make, make certain they're, they're grounded and then connected to people in the church. How many times have we seen a, a boyfriend or a girlfriend become a Christian and then the, the relationship goes awry and they break up and then we don't see them anymore? It's because we didn't get them connected to other people in, in the church. And right. so we, we need to have those, uh, those relationships where uh, we, can, we can still be accountable to one another and not just be tied to, to one person. So, so we've Perfect. used that material, getting started right, both in a formal class, and then we have uh, 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 several of our members who will, uh, who have done that privately with, with people. Uh, and that goes for also those who have, have been away for a long time and then been restored to faithful service, uh, restored to the Lord. Uh, well, uh, it's good to, to have those people uh, grounded again in those those things that maybe they've been away from for a while. That's excellent. You know, I it's my opinion and take it for what it's worth for anybody listening here. But I think if you have the resources, every local congregation, it'd be wise to have a class like this on an ongoing basis. Somebody walks into your assembly you have a chance. Hopefully you're praying for opportunities on a regular basis. I've challenged our membership to pray every single time we meet for mm. evangelistic opportunities and see how God answers that question. Bub, I've been here four months. There's been studies and conversions made based on that. And I'm in an area where people are just moving here, looking for questions and answers, but you need to have that and be proactive. And I think, again, if the church has the resources, have an ongoing class, New converts, foundations, first principles, whatever you want to call it, getting started right, whatever. And that's where you put them. You don't want to put them in in Matthew 24 class because that's where I'm at uh, this coming Sunday. Uh, they're going to be a little confused and they'll get something, but they'll get something more out of that. And I think it's wise for all the members to go through that maybe once a year. And the one who cries about that, I don't need that again, is probably the one who needs it the most. You just need to take a look at these principles freshly first. So, good for you to have a proactive approach there uh, where you are. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that. Let me, let me mention one more thing uh, before, yes. we, before we close. So uh, a while back uh, we had a kind of a concentrated focus on evangelism. And uh, one of the things that we did was to take this material, what must I do to be saved? And we made it into a little booklet format that people could have in their Bible and, and 
when we distributed it that Sunday night, I, I preached through the material. And so I, I used the audience as, as if I was studying with them. Perfect. And what that did was, was give everyone a, a tool. Somebody says, well, I don't know where to start. Well, here's, here's a simple outline that you can use. You can adapt it to your own use. You can, you can make it your own. Uh, but that at least gave everyone uh, a one lesson, a one right. short lesson to where if, if they wanted to study with someone, uh, they would they would have kind of a, a general outline to use and and scriptures to to help someone uh, learn what to do to be saved. Perfect, perfect. And I'll just add, Doy Moyer's written a book on first principles, same idea. Mike Wilson has as well. A couple of my favorites. There's others out there, um, but we can. Uh, I'll share that in some of the notes. And when I finalize all this in a few weeks, I'll do that. So another tool in the toolbox. That's the whole purpose of this and what yes. we're doing here. Fantastic. Let me say, Bubba, it's been a pleasure. I sure miss our Florida College Dry Creek days. Cabin one, cabin three, here to represent again. Those are some great memories, my friend. And, yes. Uh, are you going to be involved in camp there in Florida? Uh, I'm being asked to. We'll see what's going to happen. There's a, there's a couple of options here for me, thankfully. I need to budget my time. And I have three kids now that are camp age and see they kind of want to go to different camps. And we got to decide a lot of those logistics. Oh. But, uh, yep. Uh, it's exciting for sure. So, well. God bless you and your work there and, and appreciate all the things that you do in the kingdom. And uh, I appreciate our friendship through the years and, and how good you've been to me. And, and uh, I do miss our, our times together at camp and, and hopefully we'll be able to catch up somewhere soon. Those are the special times. It's like we're living together for one week out of the year and it goes by so fast. And I know if we were around each other more, we'd probably get tired of each other. So maybe it's good. It's only one week out of the year. So, but uh, good stuff. For week. Yeah, exactly. I appreciate it. So, so yeah, ditto back to you. So thanks again for taking time with us, Bubba. Get a chance to go on Facebook. If you're there, there's a lot of good comments from a lot of well-meaning people on there. So uh, very good. Thank Have you. a good day, Bubba. Thanks. Good to see you. You Take too, care. brother. Bye.